Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Spirit Matters, your daily Bhakti Center podcast, where we talk about spiritual subject matters and bring them into our practical daily lived lives. We are studying, going through, learning from the ancient text of the Bhagavad Gita, verse by verse, and we are talking about the verses and learning about how they how they apply to our lives. I am here with a live studio audience and our co-hosts, Achyuta Gopi and um, Doya Garanga. How are you two today? Go for it, Achyuta. All right, I'm doing fine. Oh, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, please, somebody, somebody reciprocate with the energy I'm trying to pour into this podcast. I'm alive. I'm well. I'm good. I am. Um, I am. I'm putting a Gita course together that I'm that I'm filming, and so it's been actually taking up. I'm at the crunch time where I'm getting close close to having to have it complete, and so it's it's kind of that experience of like you know you have like an essay due that you know that you've had assigned for like months, and now you're like putting in more work in three days than you have in three months, and so I'm I'm putting in a lot of work. For that and so it's kind of it's the mode i'm in the last few days in this week but i feel good about it and uh that's how i spent most of my time i gave class at the bhakti center on sunday morning for the bhagavad shravana series that they have on sundays saturday i went to balm event and that was my weekend sounds good sounds amazing i gave bhagavatam class today this morning at the bhakti center there's Bhagavatam and it was classes nice. going out the wazoo. And it was nice because I haven't given in a while because we went to Italy and, and such and whatever. So it was really, really nice to do that and be here with the Ashramites and the Bhakti Center. And yeah, I'm feeling enthusiastic today, but don't let that, <laughs> don't take it as I'm like trying to like shake you all alive. Like if y'all are whatever, because I, I most of the time I'm like, eh, whatever. But um, today I'm feeling enthusiastic, which I haven't felt in a long time. Um, so, on that note, shall we read the Bhagavad Gita? Achuta, you want to read for us? Sure. Uh, 2.15. O best among men, Arjuna, the person who is not disturbed by happiness and distress, and is steady in both, is certainly eligible for liberation. Do we want to do anything with that one? No. <laughs> that's a, that's a... <laughs> Anybody want to touch it? Anybody going to touch that one? <laughs> he said it. We just leave it. That's we right. said it. We leave it. I think he said it pretty well. It's pretty concise, simple. I think, well, what, what, I mean, what I, I think, and I think I've, I've, we maybe discussed this at Chuta at some point or this idea. I mean, we're, we're going to be, um, you know, talking a lot about, you know, get to talk, Krishna talks a lot about the idea of equanimity, you know, some, he, and this word sama gets used often, which means sameness, where we get the word sameness, where we get the word sama darshana in the fifth chapter about seeing everything and everyone equally. And Krishna defines Gita as, Krishna defines yoga in, in the second chapter of the Gita as this equanimity, samatvam yoga uchite, this, it's even this amidst happiness and distress. And, and here we're finding it as well, one who's not disturbed amongst happiness and distress. And I and I I appreciate, you know, the language here I think can be interpreted differently. The idea of not being disturbed doesn't mean we don't experience it. You know, and and, and the 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 analogy given is like the summer and the and the winter, the seasons. It doesn't mean I don't get cold in the winter and doesn't mean I don't get hot in the summer doesn't even mean that I don't maybe complain a little bit about one or the other when it comes. But this idea of it not throwing me off my game so intensely that that now dictates the life around me. And I think that this, like when I, when I work with people individually, sometimes, you know, I, I, I throw out this phrase that, you know, empowered living means I have choices, you know, and if I live a victim to circumstance that like my life is, and, and it becomes kind of scary sometimes when it's just like, we experience this sometimes at work or at the Bhakti Center where it's like, what are you doing today? And it's like, 
I don't know. It just depends on what messages I get or, you know, who I run into or, you know, what emails pop up in my inbox. And it's like, I'm no longer in control of where my day in life is going because I'm just responding to the ever erupting volcanoes of things that pop up, you know? And I think what Krishna is telling us here is like, don't let that happen to you because you're, you're on a big journey and like, happiness is going to come and like there's going to be causes for jubilation you know children are going to be born couples are going to get married you know uh, promotions are going to be had contests are going to be won like so many things are going to take place and there's going to be tremendous tribulation like people are going to die relationships are going to be broken apart um you, you know uh, bodies are going to change forms and not look as good as they did previously or whatever it is that causes you distress and he's just saying like don't like I, and he's going to get to this point later on in the Gita where he talks about Vyavasatmika Buddhi this idea of being like very fixed in purpose and I think unless we have that deeper fixed in purpose it becomes very difficult like all the little things become tremendous botherations and so really it's almost kind of like and I'll, I'll end with this question it's like spiritual depth becomes defined by the things that actually bother us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes to all of those is that things. It? Is that it? Is that good <laughs> enough? Should we move on? Next verse. Next verse. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate your your words. Next. <laughs> no, I was gonna say I was gonna say that it's a really good point, and I really loved how you brought up that it's not necessarily about not experiencing those things or, or, or being indifferent to those things, but not letting, us, not letting it disturb us so much. Um, and I really loved how you said that it's okay to like complain a little bit or a lot or vent. You know, sometimes you just need to call a friend and vent and just like say what's on your mind and say what's on your heart. I think sometimes when it comes to spirituality, we put ourselves in this mood or in this mode of like, it has to look a certain way. We have to be perfect. We have to be happy. We have to be spiritual. We have to do all these things. And it's like, you know, you're allowed to go through it. You're allowed to like, whatever, you know, it's, it's totally fine. And I think that having boundaries is really important when it comes to this kind of stuff, because I like that you mentioned Doyal about like, as opposed to living in a way where we're constantly responding to life mm. and to everything that comes at us, making a choice to what to respond to. And I think that that's very much about boundaries and saying, like knowing what you're saying yes to and knowing what you're saying no to and how those two are really important because, I'll end with this, because if you say yes to something that you actually don't wanna do or you actually don't wanna be involved with, it, can, it, it has the potential of tipping you over the edge where you will become disturbed by the happiness and the distress and the winter and the this whatever you know like that's happened to me mm. a lot of times i say yes to something that i don't want to be at or i don't want to do and then i'm there and internally i'm just like why you know and i'm just like going nuts and i'm like why did i say yes so i think it's better to know what we can and cannot handle so that way i can set myself up for success in terms of not being disturbed so much by these um ever ever you know, ever flowing, incessant, just like, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ever flowing, incessant pangs of material life. Pangs. Because that's, pangs. Because that's the thing. It's like the stuff is going to keep coming. It's like we think that once we dealt with this one problem, it's over. It's like, no, like the, the you know, the stuff is going to keep hitting the fan and it's going to keep happening and things are going to, whatever. It's like this. And then you'll have happiness for some time and then it'll go again. And so rather it's less about thinking that I have the solution to end all of my distress, but rather like you're saying, Doya, how am I not disturbed among, you know, all of this? I saw Chuta smiling when we got the word pangs. I was pangs, my favorite childhood was I drink. Actually, I was like, was I smiling or was that camera face? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's like, I was not, nothing you said made I, a smirk. No. <laughs> nothing. I, um, Don't flatter yourself. That's sometimes think, our go-to when everything's dead. We're like, I saw you nodding your head. Like, I was not nodding my head. No, I definitely was thinking about a lot. Like, though, I, I mean, there's so much on. There, and there's so much in the chat that's happening also. Like, the, the, all of the, the rivers are kind of, like, converging. Um, 
I kind of want to know then the question becomes what is worthy of getting worked up about? Uh, what is worthy of getting disturbed about? Because mm. Krishna puts in an idea that Arjuna getting upset at this point is not something that is worthy of him becoming disturbed about. But there are things in life that he definitely should have been disturbed about. And there are things in Arjuna's life that actually affect Krishna that make him unable to eat or sleep properly because he's thinking about protecting his friend. So I think, you know, we, we, we have this like idea of a blanket statement. We go pontificating off on this idea of becoming undisturbed or becoming immune. But there is no complete immunity, not here in this material world. Even if you think about scientifically how immunity works, they've got to bother your system first. Your system has to be completely like poked and prodded uh, and given some of the, the things that are going to cause it the reaction in order to get used to it. So maybe undisturbed does not mean that you are not at all bothered. Perhaps undisturbed means more at least that you're used to it that you kind of understand that this is going to happen again and again um and that maybe we've developed a game plan on how to deal with it when it does happen because even mother earth is disturbed there is nobody who is undisturbed by the forces of material nature hmm. the entire earth consistently continually is saying i'm overburdened i'm overworked i i i don't know how i can continue on with this so even she is not undisturbed even she who can deal with winter and summer seasons both so yeah i think that's that's kind of i was like um what what is the mark of that immunity Krishna's trying to vaccinate us towards material distress by giving us small doses of it so and that we can handle so, so we can handle larger <laughs> <Pretty> doses. <laughs> I I um I love that the, the idea of this word disturb cuz disturb doesn't mean it doesn't um, not that we don't experience it, but again, this idea of almost kind of like where, where is it bringing me? There was something I was thinking about. Um, there was a phrase that came to mind that I forgot it. It'll come to me later, but it was around the idea of what, 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 what is bringing me closer to myself and Krishna and what's bringing me away? And so the earth was disturbed, but it brought her closer to Krishna's shelter. Um, and so I think that that you know when we find in the in you know in the residence of Vrindavan and the stories of you know Govardhan Hill and the stories that you find in the Bhagavatam about where people turn in their times of distress. And so when our material distresses have the opportunity to bring us closer to our path. Um, then it's okay to be distressed, and and it's I mean it's also we 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 have our moments. Obviously, I mean, our, our Arjuna had his had his ugly cries and his dark moments, um, but it ultimately ultimately he made his way back to his path. And so I think the word disturbed doesn't mean not feeling; it means not um, getting too lost. I was just looking up the meaning of the word disturbed. And one of them is just to simply interrupt. Mm. Uh, and so I think that that's kind of a cool way to look at it, like to actually look at language and take away the connotations that we put on the language. So if Krishna is saying, you know, a sober person is not disturbed, it just means that they're not interrupted. Mm. It can simply mean that they continue moving. 
I think this is a really good point. Thank you so much, Achuta, for looking up the definition because it's like, yeah, we, we, we do tend to put our ideations on words sometimes. And I think this is really beautiful, this, this idea of it not being interrupted because when you, we think about our spiritual life, I was talking about this this morning in Bhagavatam class, when we think about our spiritual life, like, you know, depending on many factors, like it can potentially be interrupted. And that's what we want to avoid at all costs. And I think it's more about then like, okay, how do I, what do I need to do? How do I till the soil and prepare the ground of my life and the situations that I'm in and putting myself in so that when something you know bad happens or distressful happens, my my faith, my relationship with Krishna, my, 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 my spiritual journey towards him, so that that's not interrupted. Because I think one thing is dark night, a dark night of the soul, like Doyal was saying, that brings us closer to Krishna. Another thing is just like a dark night, you know, and things not going well and you getting yourself into, into trouble, you know? It's just and dark. And so I think it's, it's just dark. And I think, um, and I think so many of us have been through that, you know, we've been through the, that, that darkness. And when there's a pathway, like Dayal was saying, for that darkness to lead us into a place of more spiritual sincerity uh, on our journey, um, then it becomes something really beautiful. And because the goal, the goal is one of the goals, there's many goals, but the goal is that my, my, my love and my relationship with Krishna and my practicing of that relationship with Krishna doesn't get interrupted, you know? Because if it does get interrupted, that's a whole, that's that's a whole that's a whole mess. That's a whole thing. You know, it can it has it has ramifications to it that can get quite messy. I think because I'll end with this because I think that sometimes I was saying this in class this morning. I think that sometimes there can be like a little bit of a lackadaisical uh, mood around spiritual life sometimes in terms of like my chanting or my reading or my hearing or whatever it might be, right? It's like, oh, well, I love Krishna, so everything's fine. And, you know, maybe I'll chant my rounds today, maybe I won't. Or like, maybe I'll hear today or maybe I won't. Or maybe I'll read this thing or like maybe or I'm feeling like this, you know, like whatever. Or I'll chant my rounds today, but they'll be super inattentive and I'll just be like, uh, whatever. And I was mentioning today in class, it's like, you know, Srila Prabhupada has said so many times um, that his disciples weren't afraid enough of Maya. And it's like, we have to understand that like that practice is there and it's given to us for a reason. You know, it's given to us so that we don't become interrupted, so that we don't become disturbed. And if we start to kind of loosen the grip on that practice, we can quickly be arrested um, by the material energy um, because the material energy is, is intoxicating sometimes, you know, for lack of a better word. You gotta hit we that can't. little unmute. You gotta hit that little unmute button. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, protecting you all from the cars. Um, wh what I kind of like is that uh, Arjuna's spiritual practice was just relying on his friend. At at every turn, you know, and and we we put so much into it. We put so much pressure. Uh, on ourselves and sometimes we have to bring it back down to distilling it to the to the essence of what this these spiritual practices are meant to be doing which is just to remind us to rely wholly and solely on our friend and there's one section we'll get to it where krishna actually says in the Bhagavad Gita that his devotees serve him by being dependent. Which means that we have to at some point let Krishna in and stop doing this uh, emotional jugglery where we decide that we are still in control of everything by what we choose not to tell Krishna, by what we choose not to open up to Krishna about, by how many times we think, oh, God is too busy, God is too whatever, God is too like, by the ways that we shrink ourselves. Um, and there was one thought that was kind of stayed with me all weekend, which was, if I think Krishna is unlimited, 
And if I really believe that Krishna is unlimited, then, then why do I ever tell myself, oh yeah, no, I can't ask Krishna for that. I was like, that's like asking too much. We just established that the, the, the man is unlimited. Like what, how, how did the, the two don't reconcile that that's not gonna balance out. Um, so the man yeah. is unlimited. <laughs> like like he's got names, several of them. A um, right? He's like infallible. He's unlimited. He's he's he he can manifest the desires of everyone without ever lessening himself or lessening his reciprocation with anyone else. Like he is Akila Rasamrita Murti. He can simultaneously fulfill completely the desires of everyone without lessening his completeness at all. Which pretty much goes against all the rules of math that we were taught since we were six. If you have three apples, you take away two, now you've only got one apple. If you have three apples, if Krishna has three apples and he gives you three apples, he still has 3,000 apples. Like it, it's, so why do we ever think that Oh yeah, no, I can't do that. That's asking too much. Oh no, yeah, I can't do that. That's like that's way too much. Oh no, yeah, I can't do that. That's way too annoying. Like there there is no boundary like that with Krishna. So I think that the beginning of figuring this whole non-disturbance out is to take away that boundary first of of measuring Krishna, which you have said is such a apt definition for the for the meaning of maya potency it's to measure and so when we start even measuring krishna it's an illusion mm. i love what's going on in the chat by the way it's right? pretty it's fun <laughs> it's pretty good um bal Devi says he is the man in all cap locks not just a human and daryl gurunga says i'm gonna swipe right on that one and you know what? It's such a good analogy. It's we so all good. should. We all should swipe right on Krishna because it's like, you know, it's like, it's like we're, whether it's we're swiping right for the right partner or whether it's we're looking for, you know, some financial this or some academic whatever or some whatever it is, we're trying to find happiness. We're trying to find love. We're trying to find shelter in all these places and all these people and all these things that are not eternal that are not unlimited, right? And it's like, here is the man that is unlimited, that defies all the math you were taught in school. And we are being given the opportunity to swipe right on him. And we're kind of just like, <laughs> and that's really it. Like that, thank you for that image, Dayal, because it's so good. It's like, yeah, when I see Krishna come up on my screen, let me swipe right on him, <laughs> done. <laughs> Depending on how that imagery lands with you, I'm you're welcome and I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but what I what I, I do I do love the definition you gave and you brought in the the Akila, Akila Rasamrita Murti from Rupa Goswami and the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu because it's one of my favorite phrases and the idea of and the way you defined it was so beautiful that that Krishna is that person that can fulfill the the genuine inner desire for connection of every living being can, can fully feel, fill the need for love of every living being without diminishing his own completeness of love in any way. And I think that that is the, um, the challenge so many of us, you know, experience when we are feeling that aloneness in life. Um, and the search for relationship, you know, anyone, everyone I know who's in a relationship is wondering if they chose the right person. Everyone who's single is wondering when they're going to find the right person, you know, and back and forth, you know. And uh, and I think it's because we're search, we're expecting other people to be our Akila Rasa Murtamurti. Akila means complete. Rasa means flavor of love and relationship. And uh, Murti means the form, the embodiment. I'm expecting them to be that embodiment of my needs and i think that that it's almost kind of this spiritual life our, our de the development of our bhakti goes alongside us being able to fully open ourselves to krishna like 
not holding anything back. I've once somebody once said that Krishna doesn't doesn't see what you offer, he sees what you're holding back. He doesn't see what you give him, he sees what you're holding back. In the sense of just like standing naked before God. And Arjuna did that in the beginning of the second chapter. It was like the full breakdown of everything. And it's to the point of putting down his bow, you know, which is like I'm setting down every conception I have about myself, every identity that I've been given um, in standing before you in this way. And so I think that that there is this, um, what was it, Gorgo Vindamarash, who said something about spending a little time each day. Jai Jagannath quotes this. Take a little time each day to tell. Take a little time to each day to tell Krishna how your day went. It was his Vyas Puja yesterday. Oh, that's sweet. So sweet. Yeah. Gorgovinda Maharaj also said, um, "To have faith in Krishna means that you trust Krishna. Mm. Um, it is to look at the circumstances in life and say, okay, Krishna." this is happening and still I trust you mm. not to not to say that oh because I trust you none of this will happen uh it is to say that oh happiness has come and still I trust you not to let me get too carried away mm. that there is distress and I trust you not to let me get too carried away mm. I was just just watching something last evening and there was it was a, it was a, a show and there was a storyline and there was tragedy happening and there was a mother losing their child they were adults an adult mother losing their adult child who had some disease and she was praying and like like this idea of like god will heal this disease it was a fictional story of a, of, of, a, of a show and um and then like when the person finally died, it was like, I've given my life to you. Like, why have you forsaken me? This question. And like, where is your voice in this? And it's like, and, 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 and on one hand, like your heart is going out like this, this unthinkable travesty that like, I have no frame of reference for, like I have no frame of reference for that type of pain. And at the same time, it's like defining the relationship with God as like, you're supposed to fulfill my prayers. You're supposed to taking care of me looks like A, B, and C. And losing trust based on how you respond to um, X, Y, and Z in the way I think you should, you know? And our trust is so much dependent upon very specific criteria. Whereas you're saying like trusting you know, in the happiness and into the stress. It's not easy, but I was just that 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 thought was coming to my mind and I was watching this as I was hearing you speak. It was like, what is my basis of trust? Um and you know, it's easy for faith to become very um flimsy, you know. I think, you know, like guess last point is um I think that's one of the questions that I get or or complaints. Uh, sometimes my various inboxes turn into the complaint center for all the people who have a grievance with God. Uh, and and they come to me and they're like, oh, you know, you smiled and said all kind of happy go lucky things about God. But I prayed and God took away this person. Or I prayed and God took away that person. And I prayed and God took away my grandma. And I prayed and God took away my 90 year old uncle. And I prayed and God took away this person and that person. And so you'll understand when God starts taking people away from you that he's really not going to be all the things that you say he is. And I usually I'm sitting there thinking, what are we doing all this spiritual stuff for? Usually at the very beginning, when we do all this spiritual stuff, all the stuff, um, we are doing it to prepare for our next destination. How do we then decide that Krishna taking somebody to their next destination, which could very well be his supreme abode, is now a betrayal of us and our faith? Hmm. That's the ultimate victory. How do we decide 
that God taking someone to be with him is a betrayal of us. I can't believe you took that person away to what be with you to get out of the suffering of this thing that we're all trying to get out of the suffering of. Mm. This is their ultimate good fortune. If we believe what we have been putting all this work and energy into mm. question then becomes, do we actually believe? And if we don't, then why the hell are we sitting here doing all this stuff? We took it right back to the source today. Why are we even here? Why are we no, even here? Why nobody, are we every, every, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. That song. Mm. Um, there's a lot that you said there, and Kishore is pondering into the sky about to say something. He's pontific pontificating. Is that a right word? Pontificating? Yeah, pontific no, yeah. Um, but, I was going to say that we're running fresh out of time. We're <laughs> running out of time is what I was going to say. He's like, no, I had nothing. I was trying to get you guys to wrap it up. <laughs> no, but I, I was going to say just that. Well, maybe I'll do it as my takeaway. Let's hear from Kimberly first for our takeaways. And if you have any other takeaways, I see the chat is blowing up. If you have any other takeaways, please put it in the chat. Kimberly, what you got for us today? Thank you. Today I got that we should swipe right on Krishna. Woo! Because <laughs> he's unlimited and his completeness never diminishes. And we can develop a game plan to deal with our disturbances when our spiritual practice evolves to relying on him and trusting him at every moment. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Dayala Chuta, what are you taking away today? Uh, that if the plan doesn't come out, if like the execution of the plan doesn't look exactly the way I think it should look, uh, it's to it's to trust that there there is maybe perhaps a perspective, a divine perspective that I just you know I have not been able to see. And to really mm. um, value the spiritual perfection. Beautiful. What about you, Dayal? Uh, just look beyond my limited perspective. Love it. And I'm going to go with, I loved everything you said at Chuta before. I'm going to go with, do I believe what I'm preaching? Do I actually believe all this spiritual stuff? It's a really good question to, to ask oneself, I think. Um, okay, folks, botherations is a real word. It's going on in the chat. It is indeed a real word and it's a good word. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for your wonderful presence to our live studio audience, to everyone out there listening to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. We will be here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Thank you, Dayal. Thank you, Achuta. And thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.